this morning as we continue our study in the New Testament, we come to Galatians 5. Uh, Paul is giving some commands here to the Galatian followers regarding how they're to live. And, and in this particular section of Scripture in chapter 5, Paul is urging their action. He's using, in the Greek, the imperative voice. And the imperative voice says, look, these things are necessary, these things are required, these need your attention and your actions. So it's some very firm commands he's giving. And basically, you're going to see as we move through the passage this morning, basically there are four commands. We, we could sum it up this way, four commands he's giving. The first is you, you need to serve each other in love, talking primarily to the church, to the believers. Secondly, you need to be on guard against destructive behavior. And then third, and this is the biggest section of the scripture this morning, he tells them, look, you need to walk in the spirit. And as he talks about walking in the spirit, he's saying you need to know and avoid the deeds of the flesh. You need to be aware and you need to let the fruit of the spirit grow and develop in you. And then the final command is very brief where he instructs him to avoid conceit. Well, let's read together before we dive in. Let's read the passage together. Galatians chapter 5, beginning in verse 13 and reading through verse 26. He says, For you were called to freedom, brothers. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, watch out that you are not consumed by one another. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other, to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you are led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident, sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you as I warned you before that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit, let us not become conceited, provoking one another and envying one another. Well, Paul begins this section in Galatians 5 talking about the freedom that we have. Uh, Paul reminds them and, and us, we were called to freedom, not law-keeping. Now, now, here's the danger. Freedom's a pretty slippery word. It's, it's pretty easily distorted. Freedom does not mean that you can do whatever you want, uh, whenever you want, just do as you please. When, when Paul says they're called to freedom, he's reminding them that they've been called out of bondage to sin so that they can enjoy their relationship with God and also so that they can fulfill the responsibilities and the purpose that God has for them in their life. Now notice, Paul says you're called to freedom, but he says don't use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh. It's like he's reminding them, hey, your fleshly desires, your sin, are what got you into the mess in the first place, what got you into bondage in the first place. See, spiritual freedom is not the absence of boundaries. Now, can you imagine how frustrating it would be either playing in or watching a football game where there were no boundaries? Or how dangerous it would be uh, driving down an interstate that had no lines or no lanes that are marked? No, that's, that's not freedom. So, what is freedom for? When Paul talks about freedom, what is it for? How is it to be used? Well, he says that we're to use our freedom to serve one another in love. Now, can I remind you this morning that love is not a feeling? It's not about doing things for others and serving others when we feel like it. Love is a commitment. When he says we're to serve one another in love, he says we're to sacrificially seek the well-being of others. It's exactly what Jesus did. Mark 10, 45, Jesus said he didn't come to be served, but to serve. John chapter 13, 34 and 35, he told the disciples, listen, people will know that you're my disciples, that you're my followers if you have love for one another. 
John 13, 15, verse 13, he said, Greater love has no man than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. That's what Paul is talking about, serving one another in love, being willing to sacrifice. Now, verse 14, he says, look, the reason you are given the law, the reason we have the law, he says, the whole law is fulfilled and love your neighbors yourself. The law was given to the nation of Israel to tell them how they were to live in community. And we, just like them, are to live appropriately in a way that honors God by loving others, by loving our neighbor as ourself. And the opposite of that is exactly what you see in chapter 15, where he talks about them biting and, and devouring one another. You know, that's a, that's a picture, when you, when you read 15 about biting and devouring and destroying each other, that's the mentality of every man for himself. And we have to be very careful that mentality doesn't seep into the church and affect the body of Christ. I'll give you a great mental picture of what that looks like. We were just in Florida on vacation this past week, and uh, one of the evenings we had gone to the, uh, the seafood uh, market and bought some shrimp and grouper and some crab and, and uh, cooked all that for dinner. And, you know, if you've ever cooked uh, your own crab before, typically when you go to the market and buy crab, it's just the claws that you buy. But where I grew up in South Florida, typically when you cooked crab, when you cooked lobster, it, it was the whole animal. Well, you know, if you get a pod and you put crab, not just crab claws, but you put crabs in that pot, as the heat begins to increase, the crabs will start crawling out trying to escape. But they can't ever get out because as one is clawing his way, trying to get up and out of that pot, the others around him are clawing onto him and trying to do the same thing. And so they all pull each other down. They're literally devouring each other. And that's the mental picture um, that, that, that Paul gives here. We need to be careful that we're supporting and encouraging and helping and serving each other, not looking out for our own needs. Well, how do we live in freedom? How do we serve in love? Verse 16, he says, we're to walk by the Spirit. The word walk just means uh, refers to the conduct in our lives. The, the conduct of our lives should be controlled by the Spirit. He says, if we don't walk by the Spirit, we're going to gratify the desires of the flesh. Our bent is always to live life from a, from a human, uh, sinful viewpoint. Now, I want you to notice carefully what Paul says about our fleshly desires. You're still, even after you come to Christ, going to have fleshly desires. Paul doesn't say that if you walk by the Spirit, you won't have fleshly desires. He says if you walk by the Spirit, you won't gratify fleshly desires. And notice also the focus on how we live. Paul also isn't saying, look, you need to deal with these fleshly desires, and then you'll be able to walk by the Spirit. No, it's the other way around. When you are walking by the Spirit, when you're focused on the Spirit and obeying and following the Spirit, you're not going to gratify the desires of the flesh. The Spirit overrides the desires of the flesh. You can't manage the desires of your flesh on your own. You don't have the power to. The, the pull is too strong. Verse 17, he makes clear that the flesh and the Spirit are two different spheres. They are opposed to each other. This is probably going to be a silly analogy, but think of the flesh and the Spirit as, as fat and muscle. They're different. They, they can't work together to accomplish the same goal. Wouldn't it be incredible if you could somehow convert your fat into muscle? You could do some exercise or, or take some pill and convert your fat into muscle. Listen, you can't do that. Those are completely different things. However, the more muscle you build, the more fat your body is able to burn. Flesh and spirit are completely different. They're not going to work together. They're not going to operate together. We need to give strength to the spirit and follow the spirit in order to put to death the deeds of the flesh. You see, your flesh has one particular perspective. The spirit's perspective is totally different. Your flesh has uh, certain goals, and the goals of the spirit are radi radically opposed to the goals of the flesh. Your flesh has a very certain outcome, and your spirit, if you walk with the spirit, there's a completely different and opposite uh, outcome in what's going to happen. Well, we're going to see a sharp contrast. Paul's laid it out here, but we're going to see a sharp contrast in this passage. It's going to remind us of how the spirit and the flesh oppose each other. Look at verse 18. Paul is basically saying, look, you can't keep yourself in line uh, 
by focusing on the law. He's reminding the Galatians you're not under the law. Is the law important? Yes. Should we live in, in ways that please God? Yes, but we can't focus on the law. In fact, focusing on the law sometimes can tempt us even more. Imagine that you're a, an elementary or maybe a middle school or high school student. You come home from a day at school and you're, you're famished. You're starving. You walk in the back door and you smell the most incredible smell, chocolate chip cookies your mom has just pulled out of the oven. But as you round the corner in the kitchen, she sets the tray on the hot pads on the counter and says, now look, I've almost got supper ready. It's only going to be about 45 minutes or an hour. Do not eat any cookies before supper. Well, the only thing you're going to be able to focus on and think about is those warm chocolate chip cookies that just came out of the oven. And given the opportunity, if your mom's not looking and you can figure out a way that she won't miss it, you're going to go for one of those cookies. Well, Paul is saying here, look, legalistic rules are not going to help you control your flesh. And keeping legalistic rules don't make you right with God either. You, you can't earn your salvation by, by keeping the rules. You remember in Matthew 19, the rich young ruler who came to Jesus to ask what he had to do to have eternal life, and, and uh, Jesus mentioned the commands, and he said, oh, well, I, I've kept all the commands. This young man was very legalistic. He had gone through, and like, much like the Pharisees, and kept the commands as best he knew and understood how, but you remember that Jesus told him, okay, if, if you want to inherit eternal life, you go sell everything you have and give it to the poor and come follow me. Now, why did Jesus say that? He was pointing out to the young man, you may have kept the commands from a legalistic viewpoint, but God is not first in your life. You have another God, your money, your possessions. You, you've not surrendered. It's not about uh, keeping the law. It's about having a heart that is tuned and turned toward God and, and following him. And when we focus on and we follow the Spirit, we have the power to overcome these deeds of the flesh and to fulfill the true intention of the law, which is to love and to honor God. Now, verses 19 through 21, don't worry, I'm not going to read them again. Uh, verses 19 through 21 describe what the works of the flesh look like, and there's some pretty horrendous stuff in there. And those works of the flesh are very obvious and very observable. If someone is, is committing the works of the flesh, everyone sees it. I want you to think about this, though, and remember this. The works of the flesh that we read here in verses 19 through 21, these things all start in the mind. They start with our thoughts, and then they're translated into deeds. That's why Solomon, in his wisdom in Proverbs chapter 4 and verse 23, said, look, you need to guard your heart. It's the wellspring of life. What was he saying? You need to be careful what you let your mind and let your heart think about and dwell on because those things that you allow in, into your thoughts and into your mind and into your emotions and into your heart, those things are going to come out in your life. As you think about and dwell on those things, you're going to begin to act those things out. Now notice Paul says in 21, after he's made this list, it's not an exhaustive list. If you read through the list and say, oh, well, I haven't done any of those things, it's not an exhaustive list because he uses this phrase, and things like these. The bottom line is, Paul is saying, look, people who do these things are not walking in the Spirit. In fact, they're enslaved by sin. Now, there's another phrase here that could be very troubling that I want to be sure you're clear on. At the end of verse 21, he, he lists 19 through 21, all these deeds of the flesh and things like these, and then he says... People who do these things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, some commentators look at that phrase. They say, well, he's talking to the, the Galatian church. He's talking to people who've uh, placed their faith in Christ, people who are believers. So they say, well, what he's talking about is they're going to lose their uh, kingdom inheritance or reward. You may remember from a few weeks ago in 2 Corinthians 5, we talked about the judgment seat of Christ where every believer is going to give account and be rewarded or not for the things that he has done. So some commentators would say, well, he's, he's not talking about losing their salvation, and he's not. What he's talking about is they're going to lose some of their inheritance or reward. And that would be true. If you're, if you're a believer and you sin, that sin, until you confess and repent of that sin, that sin breaks fellowship with God. That sin keeps you from effectively serving him, and, and you could lose some reward as a result of that. But I think there's much more here. I think he is talking about salvation. Now, let me clarify. In Galatians 1 through 4, Paul has laid out the foundational cornerstone of salvation, justification by faith. 
he's not now, when we talk about these works, he's not now um, beginning to talk about works-based salvation. He's not saying what you do or what you don't do gets you in or keeps you out of heaven. He's not talking about works now. It's not if, if you commit one of these sins or something like this, you're no longer saved. No, your salvation comes from faith in Christ, from surrendering your life to Christ, from committing your life to Christ. It's not from your works. So let's look more closely. What is he saying? He says... Those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, from time to time, you and I, as, as believers, as followers of Christ, are going to do one of those things. We're going to sin. We're not sinless and, and sin-free. It's a constant battle between our flesh and the spirit. But the word do here literally means practice. He's saying those who practice these things. That's different than doing these things. If I'm a high school student and I'm on the baseball team and I go outside one afternoon and I pick up a baseball and throw it across the yard and go in and call my coach and said, hey, I, I practiced today. Did I practice? No, to practice means to, to do and to keep doing, or as Paul is saying here, those who habitually do these things. So here's his point. Those who practice this, these, these sins, those who habitually continue in sin, have not experienced transforming faith. They may say that they have placed their faith in Christ, but the faith that justifies a person leads to a transformed life. Remember in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, Paul said, if any man is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old has gone, the old has passed away, the new has come. Again, it doesn't mean a believer will never sin, but a believer won't live in a habitual life of sin. There's a clean break from the deeds of darkness. If, if you're still enslaved to sin and, and the works of the flesh, you're not an heir to the kingdom of God because you haven't been saved. Jesus, in his own ministry, continually called people to repentance. He told them to turn from their wicked ways or they would perish. Salvation includes repentance. You don't come to faith in Christ and then just continue to live as you please. Well, verses 22 and 23, boy, what a contrast to the works of the flesh, the, the fruit of the Spirit. You know, even the way Paul lays out these two sets of actions shows you the contrast. He calls them the works of the flesh. Works are something you do. And then he calls the contrast the fruit of the Spirit. It's something that is produced in you as you work with the Spirit. And just as the deeds of the flesh are obvious, so also the fruit of the Spirit is obvious. You can pretty well tell if someone truly knows and is walking with the Lord when you see the fruit of the Spirit uh, in their life. Jesus in, in Matthew 7 said that that those who are his are known by their fruit. It's, it's evident and it's obvious. And, and fruit is indicative of the tree. If I go out and I see a tree loaded with apples, I'm pretty sure it's not an orange tree. It's an apple tree. Fruit's indicative of the tree. Fruit, in, in the fruit, you see the, the character of the tree. Maybe you've had this experience of being with someone and, and seeing a, a child that you know either... Uh, talking like or using a mannerism or acting like one of the parents and, and you or the person with you might have said, well, that one didn't fall far from the tree. What are you saying? They, they look like their parent. The character is there. It, it's evident where they've come from. Now, I want you to notice, and, and I don't, you may have seen this before or heard this talk before, I want you to notice there that when Paul in verse 22 gets to talking about the fruit of the Spirit, the word fruit is singular. It's singular in the, in the Greek. It's not fruits, plural, many fruits. It's singular, fruit, one fruit. What Paul is doing, even though there are nine words to describe the fruit, he's giving a complete portrait of what it looks like to walk in the Spirit. And all these facets have to be in place. None are optional. You can't look at this list of nine things and say, well, yeah, I'm, I'm that and that and that. I, I'm those three things. I'm, I'm walking by the Spirit and evidencing the fruit of the Spirit. No, it's the complete picture. And in these nine words he, he, that he uses to describe the fruit, there are three triads. The, the first three, love, joy, and peace, are mental or spiritual attitudes. They're, they're habits that we have. The second three, patience, kindness, and goodness, 
are the actions that flow from those mental and spiritual attitudes. And, and then the final three, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control, are our character that's been developed from the attitudes that we have and the actions that we follow through. Well, let's very quickly, they don't need a lot of definition, but let's very quickly define the fruit of the Spirit. Love, what is love? Well, we said at the very beginning of the message, it's seeking the good of others, especially those who can't do anything in return for you. It's seeking the good of others, and that's a response to God's love and mercy for us. When we understand uh, how much God has loved us, and we really grasp that, it's much easier to demonstrate that love for others. You remember what John said, we love because he first loved us. Jesus said, I want you to love one another as I have loved you. And can I tell you, it's absolutely critical. For those of you who are part of this church body, or if you're part of another church body, it's absolutely critical uh, in, in the church that people are able to witness as a church that we love one another. I'm going to tell you that there are many unbelievers who have, have stumbled on their journey to Christ because of the lack of love they've seen in unbelievers. And I got, I got to pause here and say this. Um, I think the greatest detriment to the world seeing love among believers today, the place where we probably slip up the most often, is on social media. I think we need to be incredibly careful how we speak to and interact with one another on the social media platform. Sometimes we think we can kind of hide on those platforms, but there are people who observe us who claim to be believers and see how we speak and see whether or not we're kind. And, and that's just, that's free today, that's for what it's worth, but I think we need to be incredibly careful um, how we speak and interact with one another in that particular venue. All right, love and then joy. Uh, what is joy? It's a, um, it's a condition of our soul. It's a spiritual mental attitude. It's, it's not based on circumstances. Circumstances, if, if your joy is based on that, you're not often going to have joy in the world that we live in. Did you know the word joy has the same root in the Greek as the word grace. And, and you could literally think of it this way, your joy is based on the grace of God. As you have experienced the grace of God at work in your life, that should bring you great joy. And when you have joy in spite of your circumstances, that is an incredible witness of your, of your faith and trust. I, I guarantee you, when you're going through difficult times and people around you see joy, they're going to come ask you, they, they probably won't use the word joy, they're going to ask you, why are you so happy? Look at all this stuff that's going on in your life. How can you be so happy? And you'll have the opportunity to help them understand that you are joyous regardless of what you face in this life because it's a short time. Paul said these are momentary light afflictions. You're joyous because you've experienced the grace of God and you know what is to come. All right, love, joy, and then peace. Like joy... Joy is not the absence of unpleasant circumstances. Peace is not the absence of worldly strife. You can have peace regardless of what's going on in the world around us. Why? Because peace comes from a right relationship with God. And peace on the horizontal level comes from being in harmony with others. Not only those in our community of faith, but those in our world. We're to continually pursue peace. Love, joy, peace, patience. What is patience? It's not being easily offended. It's putting up with others. What motivates that? Well, remembering God's long-suffering, remembering God's patience for us when we were in rebellion. We're to demonstrate to others the same patience and the same uh, grace that God has given us. Kindness. Very simply, it's, it's helping rather than hurting. Kindness is the direct contrast to what you see in verse 15, that they were biting and devouring each other. You know, Paul reminded us in Romans chapter 2 and verse 4, it was the kindness of God that led us to repentance. As we live out this part of the Spirit's fruit, as we live out kindness, that could literally lead others to repentance. Goodness, benevolence, uh, generosity. You know what goodness is? It's going the second mile when you don't have to. You ever heard someone say, well, yeah, he did that or she did that out of the goodness of his heart or the goodness of her heart? It wasn't necessary. It wasn't required. They just chose to be benevolent and generous. Faithfulness, being true, being trustworthy, being reliable, being dependable. Gentleness. Now, there's a word that is often misconstrued. If, if you're in the King James or perhaps a different translation than the ESV that I'm reading from this morning, it might say the word uh, meekness. 
You know, gentleness or, or meekness in our culture can be seen as being wimpy or, or being weak or being soft, but literally the definition of gentleness or the definition of meekness is power under control. It's power that's been harnessed so that we're not pushing people. How did Jesus lead? Jesus is called the good shepherd. How does the shepherd lead? He's, he's not pushing. He's not driving. He's out front coaxing and, and, and lovingly leading. And we want to lead like our shepherd. We want to be gentle. And then finally, self-control. Very simply, that means we're not, we're not guided. We're not driven by our desires and passions, but we control our desires and passions. It's what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 9. You know, Paul often talked about the, the Christian life or walk as an athletic event. And Paul in 1 Corinthians 9 said, I discipline or I control my body. I don't, I don't run aimlessly. If I'm running a race, I'm going to stay the course and, and run for the goal. If I'm a boxer, I don't just beat the air. I make sure that every hit lands where it's supposed to. And so self-control is disciplining ourselves and, and us being the master over our desires and passions, them not controlling us. And he finishes verse 23 with this phrase, Against such things there is no law. What is he saying? Well, you're free to live this way, to do these things. No one is going to come up with a law that prohibits you from living this way. In fact, I'd go this far. I'd say if we all lived according to the Spirit, we wouldn't need laws. Because if we lived according to the Spirit, we'd be able to be in harmony with God, with men. If we walked and lived by the Spirit, we wouldn't have the issues we have in our culture and even in our church today. All right, verse 24. He says, look, if you truly belong to Christ, you've made the decision to put your fleshly, sinful desires to death. He says you've crucified your flesh. You've crucified your sin nature. And the word crucified here is in the active voice. It means it's something... Not that it has been done to you, but you have done to yourself. You remember in Luke 23 that Jesus said, If anyone wants to follow me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, listen, daily, and follow me. You know, in, in this life, we're going to continually struggle with keeping our sinful desires and passions at bay. That's just going to be a struggle for us. And that's why we have to do what Jesus said in Luke 9, 23. We have to daily choose to say no. We have to daily choose to deny or, or to put to death our selfish desires. We have to daily choose to follow Jesus. It's not a one-time event. It's not that when you come to Christ and you surrender to him, you're done. No, you daily have to make the choice to take up your cross, to put to death the, the deeds of your flesh, of yourself, and to follow him. And, and as we turn from those fleshly desires, what do we do? We turn to the Spirit. Notice in verse 25, Paul again mentions we're to live by the Spirit, and then he adds this phrase, walk by the Spirit and keep in step with the Spirit. There's the daily part. We make the choice to walk by the Spirit, and when we keep in step, that means that we're marching in sync. That means that we're, we're matching step for step what our commander, what our leader's doing. We're letting him lead us step by step. Every move, every decision, every thought, every word, every action is directed by him. He's included in everything we do, and we do nothing apart from him. That's how we have victory over the destructive nature of the flesh. That's how we produce spiritual fruit. Now, the last verse here, verse 26, Paul is referring back uh, to the problem of verse 15 the Galatians had in their relationships, the fact that they were envying and provoking one another. But, but that first phrase is a really good summary because it goes a long way in helping us in our walk with the Spirit and helping us in making sure we're using our freedom to serve one another. Look at that, that phrase. Don't be conceited. You know, we have no reason to be puffed up in pride. We have no reason to think of ourselves as being people of great importance. We have no reason to brag about our accomplishments. Apart from Christ, we are nothing. Apart from the work of the Spirit, we, we have nothing. We're abject failures. And, and if we think of ourselves too highly, we're not going to humbly submit ourselves to Christ, we're not going to surrender ourselves to the work of the Spirit. If we think of ourselves too highly, 
we can't obey the, the instruction and the example of our Lord to serve and love. So we need to be careful to have a right perspective on who we are in Christ. Well, there's not a lot I have to tell you about application. It's pretty clear. As believers, we're called to make sure that we're walking by the Spirit, we're keeping in step with the Spirit, that daily we're choosing to follow the Spirit. And if you want a, an application this morning, it's right there in verses 22 and 23. It's, it's that picture of the fruit of the Spirit, all nine aspects of the fruit of the Spirit. That, that should be like a mirror to us that we hold up daily to see if we look like what the Spirit has called us to live out, the fruit of the Spirit. Would you bow with me for just a moment? And would you take just a minute and just ask the Lord to show you where correction needs to take place? To show you where you're failing in crucifying the flesh? To show you where you're not letting the Spirit lead and guide? can't help but wonder what our witness would look like in the world around us if every believer, every Christ follower, everyone who's professed the name of Christ as Lord and Savior were putting to death the deeds of the flesh and having the Spirit produce His fruit in them. Father, help us to be the people you've called us to be Help us to daily make the choice to say no to self, to say no to sin, to say yes to your spirit. And Father, now as we close this time in the Word and look to celebrating what Christ has done for us, let that remind us and be an encouragement and be a challenge to us that because he was willing to die for us, we should be willing to live for him. For we ask these things in Christ's name. Amen.